All right. Welcome everyone to Impact Career Panels. A career panel focused on social justice. My name is Pamela Delaney and I'm the Dean of Graduate Admissions at Prescott College. This session is being recorded, so I wanted to let everyone know that you won't be on the screen unless you're speaking. So feel free to put your, um, your button on mute and um, put your chest questions in the chat throughout the session. So this session is for you as an attendee and you're welcome to add your questions throughout the panel and we will direct those to our panelists. Uh, so um, to kind of kick off what we are doing here and about what we're doing, Prescott College, our degrees, our master's degrees and PhD program uh, offer, offer individuals the opportunity to pursue a, a, a educational path that will lead to meaningful careers. This is the third in a series of four impact career uh, series that we shine the light on professions that lead to meaningful change in the world by, um, we've looked at uh, counseling, we've looked at education, and then today's focus is a focus on social justice and change making. I'm very thrilled to have three of our alums from our social justice and community organizing program here, and you'll get to see them in just a moment. But um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to read their bios and I'm going to read them because they're fantastic and I do not want to stumble over everything. So without further ado, um, I'm thrilled to have Amanda August. Amanda is a proud Wilmington, Del Willing Wilmington, Delaware native and resident who works, walks and wonders throughout her small city. After graduating high school, she left the state to travel and collect experiences around the country for over a decade. She had deeply meaningful, Im deeply impactful opportunities to connect with others, serving as an AmeriCorps member in Yavapai, Arizona, working for Outward Bound in Philly, Baltimore, and California for several years as an instructor and course director, and holding down more, social, more service sector jobs than one could count. When she returned to Delaware in 2016, she began serving as a case manager to support aging out foster youth and their transition into living independently. During this time, as a non-traditional first-generation college student, Amanda received her bachelor's from Prescott College and a master's in social justice and community organizing. This experience led her to transition into her current role as the first staff member and executive director for a small, newer nonprofit, Jefferson Street Center. More recently, Amanda also received an executive certificate in social impact strategy from the University of Pennsylvania and is currently finishing the last year of a three-year program with the Community Development Institute at University of Delaware. Amanda is responsible for facilitating the growth of S S excuse me, JSC and its transition from an all-volunteer 501c3 to a staffed organization focusing on equitable community development in Northwest Wilmington. JSC is working to create accessible incubator hub in partnership with Hanover Presbyterian Church. They also focus on leveraging resources to support the implementation of community driven revitalization, beautification and stabilization efforts through trauma informed place, ba place based frameworks. In her free time, Amanda loves being outside anything really hiking, biking, climbing, boating. She also gets super excited about live music, traveling, community garden, potlucks, thrifting, and working on her historic home in Wilmington. Thank you for joining us, Amanda. Jennifer Patterson McLaughlin, she, her, is a dedicated social, social justice advocate focused on education and dignity for all. With a BA in communication, a Master of Divinity, and an MA in social justice and community organizing, she has over 15 years of experience leading learning opportunities around immigration, race, and equity. As a senior program manager for youth and education at the International Rescue Committee, Jennifer oversees refugee youth education programs in Washington State. She trains educators on healing classrooms, a trauma-informed approach, she is a legal sponsor for an asylum seeker and has supported numerous women upon release from the Northwest Detention Center. Previously, Jennifer served as a city DEI commissioner, family minister, educator, consultant, and small business owner. She has led cross-partisan groups on immersive learning experiences, walking migrant trails in Arizona. Jennifer's personal experience navigating the U.S. immigration system 
lived experience with disabilities and background as a leader in faith communities, nonprofit, and government supports her trauma-informed asset-based lens. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. And then we have Courtney Wooten. Courtney is an anti-racist consultant specializing in equity and cross-cultural inclusion. Based in the Berkeley, Oakland Bay Area and following in the footsteps of hippies and Black Panthers, Courtney embraces a community organizing and intersectional coalition building as part of her lifelong mission for change. A Stanford alumna and current student at Prescott College with a master's in social justice and community organizing and now a PhD student in the sustainability education, Courtney believes in pairing theory and education with accountable and meaningful action as a student activist. As the founder of Suburbia Rising in Stories of Self and Solidarity and the co-founder of the Justice and Faith Collective, Courtney has brought creative, educational, and community-led events to life, partnering with Edmond School District, Snow Isle Libraries, the Committees of Color Coalition, the, Edu the Edmond Center for Arts, UC Berkeley's Othering and Belonging Institute, and more. She is a dynamic presenter, public speaker, educator, educator and writer, a skilled peacemaking circle keeper and a visual artist. The head of, multi, the head of a multicultural, multi-generational household, Courtney is also homeschooling mother to her two elementary school age daughters. Her most recent project is building the Folk, Folk Tale Forest, an inclusive, accessible wellness retreat located near the Sauk River outside Darrington, Washington. Folktale Forests will bring together immersive nature-based education, opportunities for bridging dialogue and sustainable food forest permaculture while centering intergenerational queer, black and brown wellness. So thank you so much to the three of you as I read your bios again, I'm just in awe of the work that you are doing. And so I'm gonna stop share so that we can bring you to light without the uh, without that uh, screen there, but I wanted to read a chance to meet you. And so to start with, I'm going to just jump into a really um, kind of early question, but I want this to be a dialogue where you are talking amongst each other. Our attendees, feel free to put your questions in chat and we'll bring those to surface. And this is really just meant to be a generative flowing experience. Um, so to start with, I gave a I gave your bios, but I just want to, each of you to share your experiences. And I, I'm thinking about what was that moment or series of moments in your life that said, this is the work that I need to do? Um, what brought you to this work in bringing social justice, equity, uh, and inclusion to your communities? And so if you'd like to start, um, just feel free to jump in and we'll, we'll go around table. Who's going to jump in first? <laughs> It sounds like that's um, you, Amanda. I guess it's me. Um, Go well, for I'm, it. I'm just so excited to be here with Courtney and Jennifer. It's been years since we've seen each other, but um, I follow you all on social media. And I'm just like really glad that we could all stay awake with how busy we sound to be here to support the work that Prescott's doing. Because um, gosh, like you, you both are doing so much and it's, Amazing. Um, I think, um, you know, to answer your question, Pamela, um, and we talked about this a little bit the other day, I think the moment for me, um, and it, it had been building over many years through the different types of work that I'd been doing in conversations, um, whether it was programmatic or overseeing programs um, and working in different place-based um, work. But I think there was a moment. <laughs> Actually, I remember it kind of specifically, which is crazy because I don't have a good memory. Um, but it was in Craig Gilmore's class. Um, I think it was change theory. Is that the correct name? Y'all, y'all tell me if that's that's right. Theories of change. Yeah. Theories of change. Okay, so I was close. All right. So I remember in that class, and we were doing these amazing readings and debriefing them and having, you know, our in-person or our Zoom conversations um, about, about the readings. And I was working as a social worker at that time. And I remember um, after a late night discussion, I just kind of like, I don't know, I just really became emotional with um, recognizing that 
I was part of the cycle that was not meant to help people be successful. And particularly in communities that are already, um, you know, like youth aging out of foster care, there are already disadvantages that are a part of that lifestyle that they have not chosen and, um, and their life circumstances. And so I think that was sort of the moment where I was like, I need to do something different and, and move into a role where I can work with bigger elements of community and look at the systems, you know, the vital conditions, the social determinants of health, these things that really affect the day-to-day -day infrastructure and, you know, elements of what is important and necessary for people to be able to live and thrive and, and stay connected with each other um, and also have a healthy environment, you know, to do that. And so that was, that was the spring of 2020. <laughs> so, um, so that was, um, that was my moment. Thank Courtney, you, do you want to go next? You're part of you're part of my story, so. Well, I I can go next if you'd like, um, and I don't mind either. I was gonna say, Amanda, I love that, I love that theories of change was so influential for you because it is, to this day. I mean, Jen is probably thinking of another classmate that I'm thinking of right now as well that we texted each other probably daily every other day during that class because of the the constant like mind yeah. throwing that was happening <laughs> um and cool. right now I have taken over the class for Craig so I get to walk in his footsteps teaching it which is such an honor and a privilege and just I mean it's so it's it's so wow spine tingling to get to walk with new students as they're discovering these theorists and and seeing their place in the the ongoing revolution, right? So um, yeah. that's been a joy. I would say, you know, in in one way, Pam, Pamela, your question is like to, to ask a question like that at this moment in history, right? When there is so much going on globally and there's so much going on locally around the transitions that we're in, right? Transitions over what hope means and what it means to do to do the work and what it means to embrace each other across different lines of difference. Um, I, I tend to go back to sort of those platitudes that might feel cliche, but really I don't think are, right, around things like I can't do all of the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the good that I can do. And I think that that aspect really did bring me to Prescott, where I was feeling like I am running so hard and I am doing so much and I'm not having the impact that I wanted to have. So I came to Prescott to learn how to do what I wanted to do better, to get the skills, to get the tools. And I was very lucky to, when I was at Prescott, fall back in love with, with curiosity and with the ways that knowing more and knowledge production could be a part of my own story as well. Um, I also go to, I think it's Alice Walker who said that activism is the rent that she pays for being part of part of the planet. And I feel very, very much like the more I look at my own life, the more I look at the connections I have with the people and the place and the things around me, the more I see myself as part of that ecosystem. And so when I can take action and when I can take action in ways that benefit others around me, I'm benefiting myself as well. I see that not only in terms of my own, you know, physical health and my own stamina, but also really in terms of my own mental health and, and wellness. Um, I think right now in particular, I'm, I'm located now on, uh, the West Coast up in unincorporated Snohomish County, which is on Coast Salish land. And we very recently had um, one of our youth who died by suicide. And I think of the way in which the lack of connection is, is, is an epidemic and is an epidemic that is really dangerous to our communities and to our individuals as well. 
So I think about sort of all of those things when I think about what what brought me to this place in life, what brought me down this path, um, connection and a sense of responsibility, not that we are at fault for what has happened before, but that we are here now and it's our responsibility to take from our ancestors the tools, the strengths that they've given us, the theories that they've given us, the the knowledge and wisdom that they've passed down and to build on that, to be able to pass it on to the generations that are that are coming. I'll pass it over to Jen. Mm, Art me. You're always inspiring uh, me. And it's just such a gift to, to listen uh, to you speak and share uh, and be able to speak to ways in which you have been a part of my journey and uh, a part of inspiring the change uh, for me and the, the shift and movement to uh, go to Prescott. Um, so for me, the, uh, the, the invitation, uh, the, the stirring, uh, sort of happened in uh, over years, you know, it's, it's not one conversion, it's multiple conversions that that happened. Um, but I think of uh, some key points along the way. And, uh, and they were points of recognizing that uh, something that I had believed or something that uh, was part of the ideology I was raised in didn't fit, uh, right? And so I began to have to uh, deconstruct some of those things and ask new questions and explore. And uh, life uh, has offered many of those opportunities for me. And as uh, someone that was uh, working as a uh, youth and uh, children and family minister for uh, decades, uh, I began to recognize ways in which my work in the church uh, was part of perpetuating uh, some of uh, colonialism and the ways in which uh, the service project work or mission trips uh, were were examples of white saviorism, uh, were uh, places of uh, of rescue rather than places of co-learning and and shared transformation. And uh, so began to just learn uh, and explore uh, different pathways. And in 2018, uh, family separation at the U.S. border uh, increased uh, the number of families that were separated. And, and so uh, the faith community that I was a part of uh, got involved and uh, we began housing women uh, upon release of the Northwest Detention Center. And eventually we, uh, began to house um, people longer term. And so my family chose to become a legal sponsor for an asylum seeker. And that was transformative. Uh, and around that same time, uh, when uh, the presidential election uh, was finalized in uh, 2016 and 2017 when Trump came into office as uh, president, there was a fabulous community organizing group that began meeting uh, and they were looking for space. And so I uh, was able to use the, the position I had to offer a uh, building space uh, to that group. And that is how I met Courtney. And uh, we were exploring uh, ways to do different offerings uh, for our community. Uh, and so over uh, 
time that Courtney and I began talking and working together, uh, we began shifting and, and changing uh, some of our offerings. Uh, so eventually we, we changed Vacation Bible School into anti-oppression camp. And Courtney and I got to do that together for four years. And that, that journey was so powerful and so good. And it led me uh, into this place of recognizing that I, I wanted and I needed a deeper understanding of the roots of oppression uh, because I was recognizing ways in which I was a part of perpetuating the forces of oppression in the world. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to keep uh, playing that role. I wanted to be a, an agent of change, a, a part uh, that was truly addressing uh, the wounds and uh being able to to address those within myself, uh, most importantly. Um, so that is what led me to Prescott. Uh, another friend of mine was doing her PhD at Prescott uh, in sustainability, and she was always talking about what she was learning. And uh, so that uh, that's how I I ended up doing the master's in social justice and community organizing. And I remember uh, so well the class uh, that Amanda is talking about because I started uh, my master's program in January of 2020, having no idea what was coming, um, <laughs> no idea what 2020 had to hold. It's an amazing year to be a student yeah. in social justice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can I, I add one more thing to that too uh, yes Amanda please so like you know it's funny when you you know you hear people talking and like it triggers other things in your memory and and I loved how far back you went and I was sitting here and I'm like was there anything like before this moment and and it did remind me that when I was an undergraduate at Prescott College. And I took a totally, I had to take an elective. <laughs> and I had to take, I took a class with Zoe Hammer, who, and I had no idea who she was. I was an adventure education student and also doing um, uh, psychology. So I was interested in going into wilderness therapy. But I took um, a class with her. Um, it was around, it was around a was it political landscapes or something to that effect. And it blew my mind. And so for anybody, and that I think was the impetus to actually to even thinking about SJCO. Um, so for anybody who is watching this, who is interested in taking a class with Zoe Hammer um, and now Courtney, like you should do it because it is, it is life-changing. Um, so I don't know. I just remembered I remember that while you all were talking and thinking back that far, I'm like, 2018, what was I doing in 2018? Um, but it, that was even before that. So um, I don't know. I, I just love how Prescott is so present in, in, in whatever way, you know, as students that you kind of need it to be. And mm -hmm. it's so different from any other educational experience that I've had. So anyway, I just wanted to share that funny little memory. Thank you so much, Amanda. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm so touched to hear how you each, um, you know, embarked upon your journey through Prescott, but the work that you're currently doing. And Courtney, I, I love what you said about, you know, I, I'm going to do all the good I can do. And I, I think that when we are looking at the injustices in the world and the change that needs to happen, it can feel overwhelming. And, and so just starting someplace, right? And and what I when I'm reading your bios or I'm listening to you, you all have so many things that you're doing, uh, so many very specific things in different areas. I'd love to hear an example of something that you're currently working on, an initiative or a project that you're working on um, that you would like to share with individuals. I'd be happy to start this one, this round off. Um, so really in my, in my day to day, I'm primarily working as an organizational consultant 
And I think that that's something that, um, you know, sometimes when students are going through a program like SJCO, they're thinking, well, you know, if I don't want to be a, a community organizer or if I can't be a community organizer for whatever reason in a very sort of narrow definition of it, is this still is this still a program that's for me? Um, and I would give like a 100% resounding yes. I think honestly, as a as an adjunct in the SJCO department right now, my most fun, the most fun I have is sort of, as Amanda was saying, like having students come from other programs and just be like, hey, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, like <laughs> we're doing all the good stuff over here. So please come and study with us. Um, but yeah, so working as a consultant, I get a chance to go out into all of these different organizations. I work a lot in, in education. As Jen said earlier, you know, she and I have done a lot of work in faith-based communities as well. Um, but it's it's more than just sort of the typical places that you would think of that are using social justice or DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion sort of initiatives, right? So I get a chance to work with folks who are doing you know, standard union organizing to come in and do a workshop or a retreat with them. I get a chance to come into like our local library system and help them work on workforce diversity and new hiring practices. Um, there's a lot of kind of specific programs like that, that I'm able to contract with an organization for a few months at a time or a few years at a time and come in and help do the, the skill building and the tool building and the analysis that they need in order to shift their, their thinking and their leadership pretty significantly. Um, one of the programs that Pamela briefly mentioned in the bio that I've been working on is this uh, forestry program that's out in wilderness. And this is a, a path that I think is more familiar to other Prescott folks than it was to me. Um, I do not have a background in outdoor education. I was, as I said earlier, like born in Oakland, lived in cities my whole life, and also learned a lot in the sustainability education program around the ways that connecting with nature can really help boost our wellness. Um, I came out of the COVID pandemic in the summer of 2022 with sort of like the highlight and the low, low point of my career. I came out doing this Roots to Wellness summer program that was an intergenerational summer camp. Our youngest camper was three years old. Our oldest camper was over 73 years old. We had beautiful you know, yoga in the park and we had a vegan chef who was working with our little kids to put salads together. And we had black and brown and Latino and indigenous folks connecting together and having this wellness retreat that was beautiful and was wonderful. And it was also the same period of time that I contracted COVID and ended up with long COVID. And suddenly my relationship to being able to do all the things that I wanted to do was very changed. I had to really re-understand capitalism and productivity in a totally different way, right? Who am I if I can't be productive? Who am I if I can't give back to my community in the way I wanted to? So I had to really re-understand the way that communities of care worked, right? How do, how do I understand that it is part of my trust in my community to let them care for me? And in this process, we start, I started to learn more about what does it look like to be well and what does it look like to rest and to prioritize rest? And I got to a point where physically it was something that I needed to be able to go and rest, to be able to be surrounded by by greenery and to hear the water dripping and the trees and see the birds and, and all of that. And it became something that I became very committed to providing and to pioneering in this community. Where I live, there is a smaller black and brown population. We are a hyper minority in the school district. So black folks are less than 4% of the population, for example. And also we see higher health risks, higher blood pressure readings, we see more heart disease, we see higher rates of mental health trauma, right? So I knew that this was something that was needed in our community, but it was not someone else's focus. And so that became part of my PhD project. Um, it also became something that, that I have learned just talking about and creating the possibility for is a part of that need. Um, 
as I continued to grow out of the SJCO program, one of the pieces that I took that I absolutely loved was this writing from Eve Tuck, where she talks about the importance of creating desire-based narratives. And I feel like that is one of the practices that I've been pulling into a lot of the different organizations that I get a chance to partner with professionally, right? Instead of looking and saying, what are the damages that has happened in this community? I can look instead and say, what are the dreams of this community that we have yet to realize? And that's one of the pieces that I think has helped me a lot in being able to connect with and work with the different uh, constituent groups that I get a chance to work with up here. Wow, that's a that's a powerful example. Thank you, Courtney. I know when I had the pleasure of meeting you in person last year, just that I I found that the short time that we had conversations to be um, life changing for me. So I I am so thrilled that you are out uh, teaching and helping um, organizations to to grow and to um, discover new ways of of you know embracing their communities. So thank you so much. Do we have another person who would like to share something that they're working on? I know that Amanda, I, I loved hearing about all of the things that you were doing at Jefferson Street Center, including the, what was it called, the road diet? I, I loved that idea. I, it's something that made me, but I know you're doing so much more at the center. It keeps expanding all the time. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. It's good though. I'm writing this grant right now, as we all know, this you know philanthropic process and I'm sure we all love it, right? Um, but yeah, and so writing it, I'm like, wow, there's just so much to do and we've done so much. And it's it's um it's just really interesting when um yeah, I've realized I've been there for three years now and I'm like, it feels like it's been 10 in a good way. And so um we've been doing a lot of, you know, um uh, trust building and rapport building. Um, me getting, I was hired, I think I mentioned it in the, I, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but um, I was the first staff hire for the organization in 2021. I was part-time and we have been able to raise money to grow. I'm now full-time and I've, um, I'm have i about to hire two full-time people this summer and have two AmeriCorps members. So we're like slowly building out um, but what I've, what's been really cool is, you know, thinking about, you know, Courtney, you're talking about taking your time and really finding moments for rest and respite and how important that is in the work. And I completely, am, I am so on the same page with it. And I, um, we've actually been um, reworking our organizational structure to like a four day work week. And um yeah, and the board doesn't like it, but like, you know what? They're not doing the work, so I don't care. And so, <laughs> and, and you know, we still we still do good work. And, but anyway, so um, a lot of it over the past several years has been really um, building relationships with the different communities in our place-based geography and our, our boundaries. So we are in Northwest Wilmington and it is a super diverse area. Um, socio economically uh racially um and so some of the projects that we've been doing you know we started small with like things that people can see and like you know working with the civic associations and seeing and another thing you were talking about Courtney was you know the the damages perspective and I really try hard to fight that narrative when we're writing grants and they're like what are the problem areas and I'm like the areas of opportunity are, and, you know, go on from there. Um, but we really focus the narrative around, you know, asset protection and the areas of opportunity and, um, you know, how to uplift the resources that are, are and the networks that are already in the community. So um, starting small with those beautification projects, um, you know, like showing up, showing up when there are, the cleanups and showing up when people are having an informal community meeting and just being a part of those conversations. And so we've been really relying on those and those relationships have lifted our work into these bigger projects like 
um, Pamela, you were just mentioning um, one of our bigger projects this last year and a half, um, almost two years, has been um, to install something called a road diet on one of the bigger arterial roads in Wilmington. So it's a four lane road that moves through a residential neighborhood. It's listed as 25, but nobody goes 25. And it's a road that goes in and out of the city. So people from the suburbs come in to work in the city. And so um, we held community workshops. Um, the community came and, and decided what designs they were interested in seeing if we were to change the layout. And everything, and that's the key part of what our work is, is everything is community driven. So we are never coming in and saying, hey, this is what we think you know you should do with this green space or with this lot or with this road. It's all, um, it is all community driven. And so what's really cool is we were able to raise grant money to install a temporary road diet. And just recently, um, a partner and I, we submitted a proposal to the Delaware Department of Transportation to expand the road diet um, all the way downtown past a big hospital and a huge YMCA and businesses um, up to three or almost 2.5 miles. Um, and they approved it. And so we're working with the stakeholders now so that everybody has input. So it's really, it's really kind of wild. Um, other community projects that we're doing, um, we're starting a farmer's market in an area that is a food desert in our service uh, location. And that also started because a resident posted on Facebook, why don't we have fresh food? And I was like, it's a really good question. Let's have coffee. And we were like, okay, what's the easiest lift? <laughs> you know, what can we build up to get a grocery store in here? It's like kind of hard to just get a grocery store in. So we were like, let's start a farmer's market. So we had a pop-up market last summer and we did surveys and it was super well attended and everybody was like, when's the next one? So now we're going to host recurring markets this summer and we're making sure we have, uh, we accept SNAP and WIC and um, FMNP for seniors. Um, you know, we've been working to support small businesses. So we've been, we've been doing a lot. And I think how I would like to tie a bow, and this is actually really helpful for me to talk through it. Um, Cause I'm like talking through it for this grant too, but um, we're actually building up to develop a community planning process so that um, we have, I think we're going to call it the Northwest Collective, and we are going to pay community members to be involved, and they are going to help us formulate a 10-year neighborhood initiative plan um, with priorities, like, like buckets of focuses. So it could be um, maybe more green spaces, it could be address vacant housing, it could be X, Y, and Z. And then they're going to be the accountable body that's going to hold us, you know, to the plan. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I'm also terrified, but like, <laughs> it's like everything that we've been, we talked about, you know, through our master's program, I'm constantly like, oh yeah, like we talked about this thing and we talked about networks that people have and and it's, I don't know, it's, um, yeah, it really all ties together. And so that's just a couple of, a couple of examples. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It is, it can be both terrifying and also, awesome you know, at the same time, that both things can exist. Um, but I think sometimes I the think, most awesome things are terrifying. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's like when you go on a roller coaster, they're like, I'm so glad I went on the roller coaster. Um, so yeah, thank you. Well, I will you, dive Amanda. in. Yes, great. Uh, such good stories. Uh, I've been sitting here thinking, which thing do I want to talk about? Uh, and I think my favorite thing about working for International Rescue Committee is the, the gift of being able to work with people from all over the world uh, and how much that... Um, invites me to learn more about the world and uh, it challenges my biases uh, as I work with uh, 
uh, numerous men from Afghanistan who uh, who are so such strong feminists um, and so uh, incredibly supportive of uh, education for women and really value and appreciate that uh, and uh, how so many of uh, how I've gotten to recognize that so many of our uh, newcomers to the United States or refugees uh, are are some of the smartest, strongest, most um, well resourced uh, leaders uh, because it takes that to make it through the process, uh, and also the the pathways uh, for uh, becoming a refugee uh, often are are connected with. Uh, some of the partnership relationships um, that the U.S. has had, including in Afghanistan. Uh, and I think the thing that I'm most excited about that we are doing right now is some conflict transformation groups uh, that we do. And, you know, increasingly, I'm I'm always learning that my role is to amplify uh, the voices of of others. And so in my job at IRC, I get to listen uh, to what the needs of uh, the community are. And I get to listen to our team members uh, who are evolving and, and creating a vision for how we address some of the challenges um, in our communities. So we know that students were significantly impacted by COVID uh, because there was so much lost learning. And uh, lost learning, uh, online learning over a period of six to 18 months, depending on where students live. Uh, and we know how detrimental uh, the statistics show uh, that time was for students. Um, what we don't have data on is lost learning for uh, for some other students, uh, like uh, students who are are leaving and and finding a new home uh, from Afghanistan, uh, who had schools closed, uh, many of whom for up to three years. Um, and so the transition and uh, sometimes the the mindsets that uh, that we can have as educators um, are are not uh, adequately informed about what these students um, what an adjustment and how much time um, has been lost uh, in being rooted in a in an educational environment. So we are doing these conflict transformation groups for students who have been repeatedly suspended. Uh, these kids uh, have come out of an environment where they've seen a lot of physical violence um, and uh, are, are struggling to adjust. And so uh, some of the... Um, staff on our team that uh, one gentleman at the moment uh, who is from Afghanistan is mentoring these kids and talking with them about uh, ways in which you can uh, develop and deepen your coping skills uh, and self-regulation tools uh, so that when things come up at school and there's a trigger, uh, they have a resource to turn to for how to regulate and how to self-soothe uh, and how to um, how to de-escalate uh, those moments. And uh, we are are just leading our second group, and we're hearing uh, from our school district partners that that this is a, a significant challenge in a lot of communities uh, where uh, you know there's. Uh, some racial bias happening between different populations and uh, and some fights that that break out as uh, as new populations are getting used to each other. 
And uh, I'm just so excited by the transformative power of uh, my Afghan colleagues who are able to enter space with uh, students and uh, provide a caring relationship, uh, coaching, and uh, help students be able to think uh, more broadly about what's possible for their future, uh, to imagine and set some goals, to learn uh, to de-escalate, and to recognize that uh, the future is full of so many possibilities. And uh, we've been hearing uh, so much feedback from school staff that uh, moments when these kids would have been triggered in the past, now the students are not. Uh, and they are regulating themselves and they are uh, attending school uh, and, uh, and they are uh, a joy to be around. And the students uh, are so much happier. Uh, and that that is just amazing. Uh, so we are are literally uh, leading our second one of these groups. We're going to be uh, modifying our curriculum a little bit for those groups, but we plan to lead four of them this summer and a lot more next year to provide support. And I'm just really excited to get uh, some of these terrific uh, colleagues in more uh mentoring relationships with uh, these kids to help them uh, develop the skills to overcome their own uh, challenges and resettlement. Well, these are, um, thank you so much, Jennifer. These are, uh, you have all shared such powerful, phenomenal examples of this tangible change that you're making. It is, um, it's just so inspiring to hear. And as I think about people that may be watching this and say, I want to do this type of work. I want to make an impact in the world um, in some way. Um, and we're also in a very pivotal time in our world. I know, Courtney, you mentioned that earlier where, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier too that uh, in, in previous to the session that, you know, if you, if you were to Google, is social justice dead? There are a lot of things that come up, right? So we're sort of under this, almost an assault in our country of people that are making a change and pushing back against that. And so, um, well, I think that could be some of the hyperbole that our media likes to, to do to stress us all out. What, what advice would you give to somebody who's sitting there watching this and thinking, I want to make a difference, but am I going to face barriers now that prevent me from really making a difference? And what is that piece of advice you would offer people that want to make that change to how to look past what the society is telling them and to dive in and do something meaningful that they that they decide to do. I would say listen to their gut. And uh, if your gut is as uh, a voice that is stirring you to uh, to draw in and learn more about social justice and move towards uh, using your voice uh, for change, using your life for change, Go for it. And, you know, who knows where the path is going to leave? I, I left my position uh, in church leadership uh, in March of 2020, uh, and it took three years. It was March of 2023 when I started my work at IRC. And uh, there were a lot of things in the middle. Uh, Courtney and I started a business. We did some consulting together, uh, and I did some sub substitute teaching during COVID. Uh, and the substitute teaching work that I did was one of the, the things that opened the pathway for the position I have now. And so sometimes our road leads us uh, down circuitous paths uh, that don't always go in the most immediate direction that we think they're going to go to. And, and things don't always look the way we plan. Uh, but if we continue to open ourselves to learning and choose uh, to uh, to honor that voice within. I think that, uh, that we get to live with uh, that harmony 
that that happens within when we are true to um, who we are internally. And uh, that impacts our relationships uh, and that uh, transforms the impact we are able to have in our community. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts, Amanda, Courtney? I was going to say, I think Amanda and I are making faces at each other. <laughs> <We're here. laughs> Do you want to go ahead? <laughs> go ahead. Gesturing with eyebrows. Who's going to go first? You go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I I echo what Jennifer said. And um, I think for me, what was helpful was trying different things. And even even if they felt totally out there because that was the only way that like I could expose myself to see what I connected with. And, um, and I don't know. And I think about like how <clears throat> my sister, so I'm 30, about to be 39 and my sister is 23 and she is so pragmatic and she is so like, so opposite of me. Like she has every, all of her stuff together at 23. And I definitely was not like that. And I, and I just think about, our lives are so different in great ways. Um, and she's so focused on like the singular, the singular path right now. And, and I'm so happy for her and like, and how I'm curious that as she gets older, if she's going to try different things, you know, to see if there's something else that's like fulfilling in a different way. So I think, I think that's why in my bio, I have talked about like doing I mean, that's not even the, like, that's not even all of it. Like the joke in Delaware is like, my husband says, you know, any, anywhere we go, he's like, you've worked here. Um, and so, <laughs> so I think exposing yourself to different opportunities to connect with people, to build empathy um, and to learn about other people's experiences outside of your own and to be uncomfortable I think is incredibly important um, and not in an unsafe way, but in a way that really pushes you to, you know, question how you relate to the world and what you can bring to the world. Um, and I think that was something I also brought to Prescott College was just really trying to stay open. And the more open I was able to stay, the more I felt like I was able to connect with different parts of myself and different parts of the community. So, um, before I answer, Pamela, do we are we ending like right at six? Do I have to be super? We fast? do have time. No, we do have time to continue. This conversation is is too important and too wonderful. So, um, please feel free to stay as long as you can. I know for our guests, you may need to leave, but that is totally fine. So, yes, okay. thank you, Courtney. For I'll I'll time. try to be I'll try to be concise, which is not my forte. Um, I sort of heard two questions from you. So the first was like an, is DEI dead? Is social justice dead, right? There's this mm. backlash that's really, um, you know, national and and is gaining a lot of, honestly, a lot of conservative like steam, right? And to that point, right? Obviously DEI is not dead because if it were dead, they wouldn't be pushing so hard to try to kill it, right? So- First and foremost, yeah, we need social justice experts. We need folks who are well-versed in DEI, not only in the theory, but in the practice and the application of it, and who have the skills to be able to really operationalize these values in every sort of discipline out there, right? Like there is no, there is no part of our world from, you know, a math classroom for second graders to the gas station down the block that doesn't need a social justice analysis involved in it. So I want to make that, you know, statement super clear. And then the second question that I think you asked, Pamela, was around, like, for people who are new to the field, who are feeling like, oh, my goodness, am I going to step, like, step into the world and have the door immediately slammed in my face? Maybe right? Let's, let's be realistic about it. Like maybe, maybe you will have the door slammed in your face. Maybe you will lose friends over speaking up for what matters. Maybe you will find that the place you wanted to go isn't open to your values showing up that way. And 
that's okay, right? Like silence isn't going to save us. Innocence isn't going to protect us. There really isn't a collective future if we don't start to embrace and hone these skills and really communicate about them, right? So I would not want to lie to anyone and say that speaking up and standing up for social justice is easy all the time. It definitely isn't. I wouldn't want to lie to somebody and even say that it's safe all the time. And I think that I think that the idea of safety is probably something we could have another whole hour on too, right? About what is safety, what is discomfort. But really, truly, like w- the world we live in isn't safe, right? It hasn't been safe for many of us in this room. It hasn't been safe for our neighbors in uh, in cities where there is high levels of police brutality. It's not safe for our neighbors who are living in tents and they are not housed. It's not safe for our siblings in Palestine or in Ukraine or in, you know, in many different places, right? The systems of oppression continue to oppress, right? Those are not systems that are broken. They're working as intended. So we need people who understand social justice, who understand the theory, the application, the practice, who can continue to iterate this, who continue to take up the mantle. We are so lucky to be here in this moment right now where the world needs people who can stand up and slay dragons because they're everywhere, right? SJCO is a program that I believe really does transform lives because it puts you in community with people who who give a damn, right? Like the at the very top of this hour, you saw Jen and Amanda and I come together and we were like, we haven't seen each other in years. Oh my goodness, how exciting that you're doing this work in a different place. It looks different. It sounds different. And I'm already making notes on the side about like, oh, I should reach back out to Amanda and see if like, I can thought partner with her on some of this work that I'm doing, that she's doing in a totally different place. You know, Jen and I managed to have dinner fairly recently, but oh my goodness, clearly we need to again too, right? SJCO is not only the education part and the the projects that you get to do while you're there, but it is this network of people who care, right? Who care about making the world a better place. And if we don't care, we're never going to make it better. Yes, you're going to hit obstacles. I promise you, you're going to have doors slammed in your face. I have lost friends who, you know, I regret losing that relationship. And also, if that relationship was requiring me to stay silent about things that were that were important, that wasn't a relationship that I could nurture in that way. My, my door is open to them. The bridge is still there if they'd like to cross it. But I'm not going to deny someone else's humanity in order to make nice with someone. I think SJCO as a program can also help give us that that moral clarity and that backbone to do the work that the world needs us to do. I only took two minutes over six o'clock. So that was so <laughs> good, Courtney. Oh my gosh. That was great. Absolutely. I, I feel the same two- way. Yeah. I was just gonna say too, and with that, with Courtney, what she was saying, I think connecting that also to the intersectionality that is available in the program is so incredibly important. And the fact that like, you know, I, I came in, I can, I can only speak for myself, but I came in without, you know, a social justice background, but I was able to connect my own personal history and then connecting the work to what I was doing at the time and to what I wanted to do. And I really, that was so formative for me because I did my, senior project or my thesis um, in the work that I was aspiring to do. So it really helped me formulate that that more clarity like that you're talking about and how that can filter into the work that we are doing on the community. So I just, I really wanted to share that point because that was, yeah, that was important, but thank you. I, I had one last thought as well. Thanks for that, Amanda. Um, I wanted to say, you know, it's it's not always the position with the title that uh, is what comes right away. Um, but I want to encourage and invite and another thing that I, I did after finishing the master's in SJCO was to become a city commissioner. And that 
was a, the best decision I could have made. Uh, and uh, I served on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission for my city. But talk about an opportunity to advocate and to use your voice and to learn about what is happening in your community and uh, become involved in decisions that are being made about policing and jails and housing. And whether you become an arts commissioner or a human rights commission commissioner or a diversity and equity and inclusion commissioner, parks, whatever, um, it's a great way, whether through your city or your county, uh, to serve and to be able to use your voice. So uh, just one more practical uh, way that, that you can uh, use your voice and uh, be a part of change and change the people you are in relationship with. That's a really great point, Jen. I was going to say, as Amanda was saying earlier, right, her board doesn't support that four day work week, but I sit on a couple of boards now that I wish I could have an EG that was advocating for a better work-life balance. Like we're trying to, to lead in that direction. Um, sort of to the point that I was trying to make earlier when I got up on my soapbox, but everybody has a role in the revolution, right? And there should be space for social justice in almost any track that you want to take. It might not be in your title, as Jen was saying, but having the lens, having the skills, having the tools, having the analysis is so important in any, you know, if you're working in a bank, if you're working in a school, if you're working in healthcare or in transportation as Amanda's project, right? If you're working in the schools as Jen's project, right? All of these different roles really benefit from having folks who, who understand systemic and structural oppression mm -hmm. and liberation, right? The flip side of it too, not just not mm -hmm. just the damage, but what what does it look like to build our collective radical imaginations and get to a point where our all of us are truly free, right? Mm -hmm. we, we don't have that yet. So being able to discuss that in any boardroom is really transformational mm -hmm. or could be. Mm. I'm pumped up, y'all. I'm ready to go. Like, put me in, coach. <laughs> <laughs> do it <laughs> so love it so am I I'm so glad that three of you are together and you know sharing again and connecting again and and, and just see where you've all gone this is such a great opportunity um you know and I maybe we need a part two like Courtney was saying maybe we need a part two to check in and see what you're doing in the near future I I just want to thank the three of you so much for sharing your time with everyone um, and sharing the work that you're doing. You inspire us. Um, we learn from you and grow from this. So I, I, um, I'm deeply, deeply honored and thankful for your time. And for our attendees, thank you for your time um, because I hope that um, this has helped you learn not just about our social justice and community organizing program, but the importance of, like Courtney says, the lens of social justice um, in everything we do. That's such an important thing. And I, I think that that is something that we can all carry forward. So um, yeah, I will let you all go and have a wonderful evening, but I really just want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart for all that, you, that you're doing for our, for our communities. Thank you for having us. Good luck to thank all the you. students. <laughs> We're all students all the time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>